All right. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Does it give a does it give an indicator on your side how well my speech is coming through on your microphone? Oh, uh, hang on. Hello. Ooh. <laughs> Top notch. Now try that. You, you and on you. Yeah, testing. One, two, three. Yeah. Oh, hey, Jay. How's it going? I'm good. Can he, can he hear you? Yeah, he can hear me. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, quick reminder uh, make sure that you've got your textbooks ordered after college by Emily Young Reef. Um, I can give you the ISBN number after class if you haven't uh, done that already. Yes, Cordell. Okay, so we'll probably have our first assigned reading for this probably in another. A uh, week or two weeks. Okay, so hopefully by then um, shipment should arrive. If not, let me know. I can I can definitely share my copy for a week or two. I uh, um, I'm I'm fine that way. All right. Uh, other reminder is uh, last week uh, we started talking about as seniors how you um, are going to be giving advice to the freshmen. Um, and so um, I'm going to let you guys drive that. I should have the first set of questions from the freshmen available tomorrow. Okay, and so I'll, um, I'll be passing those on to you as, as well. Um, so um, <laughs> what I think I'll have you do for, for next week is before you see that list, um, I'll have you um, generate kind of your set of advice that you think the freshmen need to know, um, like three to four things that you think every freshman needs to know. Um, and then I'll open up the, the full set of questions that I hinted at last week that I um, Collected from last year's freshmen, and then each week I'll be adding to that the, the questions that this year's uh, freshmen ask. So you'll be able to use that as part of your your planning. So um, so that should be something that is ongoing outside of the class in um, and fi figuring that out. Um, so I am recording. Uh, this via Zoom. So for those of you who are athletes, I'll post that as well on Canvas so you won't feel like you're just completely missing out. Sorry about last week. Turns out um, that unless you pay for the enterprise version of Google Meet, you can't record those. And so I had to switch over to the Zoom. So because we do pay the enterprise version of that. Okay, so um, before I get started, are there any additional questions that you guys have for me? Yes, Adam. Do we have any updates on the uh, the mini retreat, whether that's going to be a thing or not? Uh, yes. So we talked about this week as a department, and there was general consensus that we would do that. Probably say like a two to four hour time uh, on a, a Saturday afternoon. Uh, so. Um, what I haven't done yet is try to find a, a good Saturday afternoon. So um, let's try to do this via uh, um, uh, Slack. I'll set up a poll with um, several candidates um, days that, that might work. I'd especially be interested um, athletes if you've got uh, games on, on that Saturday so I can try to avoid meeting during uh, those times. Uh, so <clears throat> Uh, once we do that, then, then we'll have uh, that. It will be shorter. It will be pretty targeted. Um, and that might be a really good time. 
to do that senior, at, at, at least one of the senior advice sessions that you're talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so today, uh, what I wanted to spend our time focusing on is the idea of balancing career and family. Okay. Um, so, um, I don't think I have to ask the question, how many of you would like to have an unbalanced uh, career versus uh, family um, perspective on, on life. Uh, I, I'm guessing that there won't be very much that any hands raised for it. And I think in general, um, if you ask the general populace, even if we don't include uh, Christians in the mix, um, most people are going to want to try to, to do this. So I, I, what I want to start off with questions, and maybe you can get in maybe a small group of, of two or three, I'm going to do some rapid fire questions. So we're not going to talk for five minutes for each question, maybe like 30 seconds for each question, and then we'll come back together. Um, so get together in a group of three, and the first question I want you to kind of maybe discuss is, if, if what I just said is true, that most people want to balance their family and career, then why are we bothering to talk about it? Why, why is it an issue? Why, why do, um, do people have to deal with this if so many people want to have that, that balance in place? All right, so get together in your groups. Um, and um, Everyone, uh, all right, they're, they're potted up. Why do we have to deal with it? Um, capitalism. That's why we have to deal with it. <laughs> I think it's harder than it seems in some people's overall I think it's harder than it seems and some people overcommit to their jobs to where work comes home when they wouldn't necessarily want it but don't know how to say no to it or right. raise the problem. Yeah. There are other pressures where, like, you know, from your boss or whoever, and their incentive is to get the work done, not necessarily for work life balance. So. <laughs> Rapid fire. So um, back there, what was one thing that you said might be a reason why we we still talk about that if everyone doesn't sure. uh, want to? Because it's even though people want to have balanced lives, it's difficult to have those. So we need to like, talk about how we go about it. Okay, how many other in their group said they thought it was difficult and that was being true? Most of you. Did anyone else have a, a, a thought? Okay, so let me just bring it back to the next obvious question, then why is it difficult? Okay, get back to that question. Why is it difficult? Capitalism. <laughs> I guess we kind of answered that question. We did. External pressures. Okay, now I'll go on this side of the room here. What was one of the reasons why you guys said that it is difficult? Um, because there could be something happening during the home or at work that pushes you not away from the environment. Okay, so there can be stressors re related to that. What's another reason that you guys talked about? Yeah, uh, trying to like think of work as a, a means for providing for your family. So if you can get a, a raise or, or Get promoted faster. Like that would be helpful for your family. So there's a lot of pressure. Okay, so the, they're they're not discreet, right? You're the reason. One of the reasons why you have a job is is for your your family. What else? I was mentioning that there's a lot of different things that like require your attention, and I mean you have to go from one thing to the next to the next throughout the day. You don't know what's the summer. You need more time. Okay, so it's hard to prioritize sometimes between the different tensions that you feel. I saw a hand back here. Uh, it's kind of what he was saying, but like 
everything you're involved in will tell you that it's the most important thing you're involved in. And so like they'll say, I know you're involved in a lot of other things, but this is the thing you have to work on. Okay. You probably let me guess that that's especially true right now, right? There's so many <laughs> options that you have available here yeah. at, at Taylor, right? Okay. Anything else that, that your uh, group came up with? All right. Um, so I, I think those those are all really accurate observations. Of that. Um, I don't know if if any of you have had personal experience, like your one or both of your parents have, have struggled uh, balancing um, this, and so you've been able to see that, or, or you've seen it in friends, or or this is kind of as you've been experiencing classes here at Taylor, as you've had internships, you've started to, to see how, how that, that might play out. Um, I'm going to make this very personal. I'll, I'll share kind of uh, my feelings and my experiences. Um, so um, what I would like you to do is ask questions of me, interrupt me and, and ask what about this or how have you done that? Um, if this has happened, how have you handled this, this situation and, and so forth? So be, before I go any further though, the first thing I want to be very clear is I don't think of myself as the greatest role model in this. It's hard for, for me to, to do. And so what, the perspective that I'm going to share it along is why it's hard for me, why it's a struggle for me, and how I fail, and 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 maybe that at least will um, give you additional insight in, um, into um, what is is difficult, and um, and maybe better insight even than me specifically on how you might specifically handle those situations better than, than I do. Or did. Uh, hopefully I can improve. Um, so um, I don't know where to start uh, because it's there's it's it's hard to disentangle like some of you mentioned like how everything fits to, together. Um, I will mention uh, that this summer, um, uh, as you know, I was uh, on sabbatical last year, and my sabbatical was to, to work in industry, um, to get more industry experience, um, and, and the, the last uh, day of that, they had kind of like a, a Zoom equivalent of a going away party. Um, and 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 one uh, uh, one of the questions they asked was, you know, which classes I'll be teaching here in, in the fall, and and I mentioned this class as, as one of them and explained some of the topics that we'll we'll do. And this particular topic was uh, especially interesting to them. They they asked, so what are you going to talk about when when it comes to this particular topic? So this is very relevant uh, to to them, um, and. Uh, and they wanted to, to hear uh, what I was, had to say. Of course, I wasn't spending a full hour and a half on just that one answer, so I went rapidly through it. Um, uh, but and hopefully, uh, you'll you'll hear some of the, the same things that I tried to, to respond to them. And uh, the the first thing that that I told them, and uh, I. Maybe I'll get pushed back even on this from you. Is um, uh, that I I think that um, a rigid forty-hour work week is not a, a realistic expectation for your job. That going in at eight o'clock, leaving at five o'clock, or, or you know a, you know a Dolly Parton nine to five job just does not. Uh, it it never has. Uh, or, nor do I think it ever will resonate with the, the way I think about a job. Um, I, I think that 
Um, especially in a, um, a salaried position, it's really hard to think of it as um, clocking in and clocking out when you, when you aren't being paid uh, by the hour. You're paid to complete a, a job and get it done. And, and, and there's been hopefully discussion between you and your project managers about what, what that will take. And so I think it, it's really important to be very candid with your project managers about what you can and can't do and why you can or can't do the things you're being asked to do. A good project manager needs to be able to understand what your capabilities are, how far you're going to get along on the project, and, and having a good deadline um, and meeting that deadline is much more valuable than pushing their employees to do things that they, they can't do. Um, and, and so uh, at the same time, there are periods of time when there are pushes from the company. Um, I, I like that, that was it, I, it was you, Jacob, you mentioned that there's stresses from both the, the family and the, the job at, at different times, right? Um, there are projects that, uh, and you've experienced this here at school, where deadlines are not really flexible, right? We can't make something due after finals week, right? That just doesn't, doesn't work. The same thing is sometimes true in the, the work environment, that there, there is some sort of a harder deadline. Um, as a, an example, I've said this in the past when I've done senior projects, uh, if, if, imagine that you're working at a company and they've already committed to this big Super Bowl ad, right? And this is a huge push and they're, they're announcing your company at the Super Bowl. You, you have to have that ready by the time the Super Bowl happens. Otherwise, uh, it's a complete waste of your, your money from the company's perspective. And so that you've got a pretty hard deadline because of that. There are other deadlines that aren't as hard. They're, they're much more squishy than you have experienced here at, at, at Taylor. Um, and you need to be able to understand which is which. For me personally, what I like to do is I like to try to think um, in kind of a, an analogy to a farmer. So if you think of a farmer, you know, watch out here over the next month or, or two as, as harvest takes place. But the, the same is true in spring planting. The, har the, the farmer doesn't say, oh, at five o'clock, I'm gonna drive the tractor in, turn it off and get done, right? Because they don't control the weather. They don't control the weight range. They don't control when it warms up. They're uh, under the mercy of, of the worst weather. And so when it's ready to plant, they plant until they, they can't plant anymore. And the same is true uh, at harvest. When the, when the, the, when the, it's ripe and it's time to harvest, you, you get the grain, you get the corn, the soybean, uh, or, or whatever crop you're, you're growing, and you do it, um, if, if you watch carefully out here this, this fall, you'll see the farmers going past midnight sometimes until they can't drive the tractor straight anymore, right? They are exhausted, but they know that they have to keep going and get it in before the snow comes or before um, wildlife comes and forages their, their food, right? They are under this extreme time pressure to get it in, and there's, there's nothing they can do about it. But how does the farmer manage that? And I think it, this is an important answer, is that it's seasonal. The farmer isn't at this, I'm working until midnight, every single night of every single week of the entire year. It's a season, there are, there are weeks in a few months where they're pushing, like there's no push um, left in them, but then there is a break. There is a time to re relax a little bit and maybe not push to that same extent as they were during those hard times. And I think 
for me, that is a more realistic picture of what work has to be like, where there's that intense push and you're working hard and you're putting in more than your traditional 40 hour week, but you know, and you, you know it's true that there, it's for that limited time and that your, your supervisor, your project manager, whoever, isn't going to keep pushing you week after week after week in that. And you have that short ish time span where you know when that's going to end and when they're going to get relief and released back into that. And for me, that is a, um, that's just a, a natural way of, of thinking about my work. And, excuse me. And so, so sometimes I'm pushing really hard on, on work and I'm getting that done and I'm spending less time with my family. But after that's done, uh, it's the opposite is true. I'm spending even more time with my family and I'm spending less time at work. And it, hopefully that's where, for me, the balance comes from. It's, it's, it's not because I'm in this sort of equilibrium all year long and I'm doing equal amounts of, of both work and family and, and so forth. It's, it's that it, it kind of is more like a seesaw and it goes back and forth between those two demands. And sometimes it goes heavily one way or, or the other. Um, and so that's kind of what I have when, when, when I'm kind of thinking about how to, to proceed. Yes. How does the seesaw affect your family and your kids and then the seasons like when you're around more and, and for seasons when you're, it's typically the other way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, it is hard uh, on my family when I, I'm not there. My wife feels like she has to do more at home and it's uh, increased stress when, when I'm doing that. Um, and um, I try to, um, I try not to neglect my kids even when I'm working harder. So, um, so as an example, let, let me give you kind of how my normal day works. Um, right now, my wife and I are homeschooling our youngest three and our oldest is in, in, high, in the public high school uh, here in town or north of town. And, um, and so uh, I come home uh, to do math with, with my kids for uh, the, the five days of the week. Um, so uh, I get up, I try to get in by eight o'clock in the morning here, um, and I work on whatever needs to happen that, that morning. Um, and then I head home this semester, every semester is a little different, but this semester I head home at one, spend between the three girls, about uh, two hours on, on, on math. Uh, I just got back, say about 3.15 here to today, and I'll be working again until um, maybe 5.30, 5.45 before I leave, again to, to go to my daughter's volleyball game. But during, during this fall, it, it's a game almost every night of the week, whether it's my oldest daughter's volleyball games or um, soccer games that, that I'm coaching or watching with, with other. Um, so there's, there's, so I go home and spend that time with my family, but I haven't, most of the time at that point, I haven't even put in a, a true eight hour day, much less, you know, that in, intense time. Uh, but I intentionally wait uh, until the kids go to bed, uh, and then I re-pick up where, where I left off and put in additional time. So I know a lot of you have seen me online late at night, and that's why, because um, I, need to keep, I need to finish 
whatever that day's work is. So I was home for two hours, but I spend usually probably three or four hours um, after the, the kids go to bed to complete everything that, that needs to get done that evening. But I intentionally don't do it while they're awake to try to minimize the effect that it has on them. Um, that is getting harder as they're getting colder and wanting to go to bed later and later. Okay, and I'm not coming up with a great solution yet for that. Um, so that worked great when my kids were little um, and bedtime was would start at seven and they'd be all asleep by like eight o'clock. Um, now my, my oldest is sometimes going to bed, you know, uh, late herself and that it's no longer feasible for me to wait until she goes uh, to bed but I still do wait for the younger ones to, to go to bed. Um, uh, so that's how that's an example of how it is hard on them they still notice when I'm working a lot but they know that they can I haven't verbalized this to them but they kind of know instinctively that Supper time until bedtime is their time with me. Um, and, and that they can kind of count on that. Whether it's in this season where we're kind of playing games, um, sports, I should say, together, or it's you know game nights in the winter, or it's uh, whatever. They, they, they kind of just, that's part of their mentality. And they're very disappointed, it's very clear, when something prevents that from happening. So like this week, Monday, when I came back in for the practicum presentations was a real disappointment for them because that interrupted that, that normal routine that they had. Um, yeah. Having children changes you in a, in a lot of ways, but um, <laughs> in a lot of unexpected ways, even if you anticipate it, it's, it, it, it doesn't real, really, you can't prepare yourself for it well, no matter how hard you try. Um, one of the ways that I was unprepared was that um, before we had kids, my schedule was much more flexible because uh, it was just my wife and I, She's an adult, I'm an adult. There's a lot of understanding and flexibility about when you have to do something. It's a lot easier to reason with an adult about, see, this is important. We can both agree I'm going to go to work right now, but I'll be home for an extra day at this other time instead. And um, that's really hard to have that kind of a conversation with a two-year-old. Right? <laughs> a two-year-old doesn't understand that work is important and daddy's bringing home the, the money to pay for the food and to keep the electricity in on and all, all those kinds of things. But that kind of a conversation it, is a non-starter, right? Um, and um, what, I, what I didn't understand, especially with young kids, is how little time there is for a working adult to spend with your children, okay? Uh, so let me give you an example for, you know, say, um, say birth through, uh, you know, first, second grade, that, that kind of age range. Um, for, for every kid's a little bit different too, but in general, um, I would get up in the morning around the same time uh, as, as my daughter's. Um, usually because they were getting up and they needed some sort of supervision. Um, and I would, you know, do whatever normal morning routine is. You know, you get up, you get dressed, you eat, take a shower. Um, but soon after that, you know, I'm coming into work. So while I'm awake and I'm with my kids, that morning time really isn't all that meaningful. Um, it, I'm pretty groggy, I don't talk to me, I haven't uh, woken up yet, you know, I've never said that, but there's, I'm sure there's that, that, uh, that grumpy glare in, in my face and, and eyes, right? It's not really that meaningful of a time, that, that morning time. 
Um, um, so, <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. so then, even even if you um, do have like this clock in clock out time, like if you think of a normal work experience, you get up, you leave for work, you have what maybe you know unless you live here in Dublin, maybe you have like a half hour commute to to work, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. I know I know it depends. You know this spring it was more like an hour commute for me, um, but and I know that you know, some people really work hard at having a shorter commute, but half hour is a nice kind of reasonable uh, estimate for a lot of people. You work, so say you leave at eight, you get there at 8.30, you work uh, until five, say, and you've got that really regimented, I'm gonna leave at five. You drive home, it's not till 5.30 that you get home. Um, but, uh, when, when I get home, it is, completely chaotic. I don't care what day of the week or what went on because uh, my kids and sometimes my wife are just uh, very hungry and and until that need has been met, it doesn't matter. Um, that's where the chaos stems from. And that's beyond second grade. That still is going on for me, for me right now. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to concentrate and help my wife finish getting dinner on the table and, and eating. And um, it can be especially chaotic right now because with those games I was talking about, it's like, oh, we needed to leave 10 minutes ago, so we're not super late for this or whatever, right? And trying to eat and do all those things, it is tough as well. So then you talk about eating um, and say, say dinner was ready at 5.30 you know, maybe eat for in, until six. Um, I don't know if you heard me say just a little while ago that bedtime used to start for, for my youngest at seven. So that means I've got one hour with my children before it's bedtime. And that's like the best possible scenario. And I completely was unprepared for that. I didn't realize how how that played out and, and, and how, how to, to navigate that. Um, because I never spent time thinking about something as simple as I have to, to work and then my kids have to go to bed because they're young. Um, my kids are going to bed more like 8 or 8.30 now, but if you that still isn't a lot of time, right? There just isn't a lot of time in the day that you spend with your children compared to work, no matter how you slice it. If, if you're going for equal proportion, I, I, I don't know how, maybe work third shift and I don't know. It's, I don't know how possible to bring your kids to work with you. <laughs> you know, go, go back to kind of the master apprentice phase. Um, and so there's, an, there's always going to be that kind of an inherent tension. Uh, for me, like as a father, am I doing enough for my kids? And if I just measure it on the amount of time I spend with my kids, if that's the only metric that I, that I use to evaluate, I'm uh, it's going to feel like a failure most of the time. Um, so to maintain sanity, that I can't use that as metric. Maybe it's a good metric, but I can't use it. Um, so instead, what I have to do is um, I have to measure it on maybe less tangible things maybe much more subjective things. Things like um, how great it feels when I come home and my kids go running out to me, daddy, daddy, daddy. That does feel super awesome. <laughs> um, 
and they're excited to see me and they're wanting to do those activities with me. It says, you know, that there is some connection between them. They want to, they want to foster it, you know, they want to spend that, that time with me. Um, it's good that they show disappointment when I'm not able to be there because it means that they expect that time with me and that they're, they're missing that, that time. Um, it's bad when they say you're never around or you always miss these things or something like that, right? I have to use, I have to be listening for those kinds of cues. Those, those kind of words don't normally get, get spoken because the younger kids aren't quite able to piece everything together. And the older kids, if it's become a pattern, have already check me out and assume that I'm not, I'm not going to be a part of their life. Right? So you don't, I don't, I haven't heard that comment, but I have to constantly ask, are there synonyms to that where they're saying something that basically effectively means the same thing? If it is, that's when I have to, to really check and say, hey, have I let, have I let this go? too far in, in, in one direction. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's really difficult. And, and like I said, this, this spring, it wasn't a half hour commute for me, it was a one hour commute for me. Um, and, and so, um, The, the way I tried to balance that was um, twofold. I had two kind of two days, two types of days that, that I worked at this company. Um, day one, day type one, was I would get up super early, um, go for a run, and then go into the office. And usually I would leave home before anyone else in the house was up. Because then my commute and work time felt more like it is here at Taylor and I got home kind of at that normal 5.30, 6 o'clock time. It kind of felt like a, a normal day. I just missed that kind of not so meaningful breakfast time. In the day. Um, so I was day type one. And um, day type two was we continued to homeschool our kids while we were out in, in California. Um, and so what I, that, was, that isn't compatible with that first type of day that I just mentioned. And unlike here, where I can easily slip home, meet with my kids, and then come back, an hour commute doesn't facilitate that kind of thing. So instead what I did is I got up, did my part of the homeschooling with my girls, and then left a little bit later, got into work closer to 9.30 or 10. Um, and then uh, I would stay late. Um, but what I try to do is come home a, uh, a little bit, maybe a half hour after dinner was over. Um, and, and so not too much of that evening time was completely lost as, as a result. And that's how I tried to resolve that this, this spring. Um, and um, and I, there are very clear indicators to me that uh, that, that worked. But that only worked um, for me because the company I worked at um, served dinner every night. And so I could quick grab a bite of dinner and come home and I didn't have to do dinner um, and, and uh, beyond. So that was that was a nice benefit. Uh, I was able to take advantage at, at work and it helped surprisingly uh, with, with trying to, to deal with this issue. Um, so that was that was the first surprise for me is I didn't realize how little time I truly get with, with my kids. 
Um, um, the second one, the second surprise for me was um, how difficult it is to balance when both um, the husband and wife are working. Um, so when, when I first got here, um, my wife, uh, I, we met in Chicago and she had just finished up her master's degree in counseling psychology and had been working at um, Trinity uh, Evangelical Divinity School in their counseling center. And so when she came here, she started working at the counseling center here at, at Taylor. Um, and, um, and that was great. There was lots of opportunity for her. She enjoyed that work. It really fit well with, with her calling. It's just counseling is, she's great at it. And it's awesome to see her do that. Um, and um, after our, our first kid, so the way that we, she was, um, because of how the counseling center works, she was always part-time um, to begin with. And so we scheduled her part-times. So basically, I would teach all my classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and I would do things on Tuesday and Thursday morning with meetings and uh, open office hours and whatever. And then I would go home at noon, and she would come into to school, and she would work Tuesday and Thursday um, afternoon. Which meant that then I had like a part-time job taking care of my daughter while she was at, at work, but I had to make up that time after work. And, and, and what that meant is that it felt like I never saw my wife. Uh, because either I was here at work and she was home with our kid, or she was here at work and I was home with our kid, and um, and then when we were both home, I was trying to do the work that I didn't do while I was at home with our child. And oh, that that was that was not a good solution for us. Um, and I thought it'd just be easy, right? I've got this flexible professor type job. I don't have to nine to five. I can just do whatever. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> That was really hard. It was. I felt. I felt very lonely. I know that she felt very lonely. It didn't feel like there was much connection between the two of us because it felt like we were just uh, ships passing in the wind, um, never really together that much. Um, and uh, we had a, a second child. She tried to keep working, and not because of what I was. Talking about. It took me probably a, a year or two after this was all said and done for me to put pieces there. I was like, oh, that's why it was so hard. I, I, I'm, I'm not the sharpest uh, tool in the shed when it comes to this kind of stuff. Uh, so um, after our second child, um, within a few months, she decided to just stay home full time because uh, as a counselor, um, the way that she does it well is that she's really empathic with her clients and really emotionally um, uh, feeling and, and sharing uh, with them. And and she, at the end of the day, she had kind of she was just emotionally exhausted, and she didn't have anything more left for her home. And that's not the kind of mom that she wanted to be. She didn't want to be this. I don't have any emotional energy for my family because I gave it all away at work. And so that's the reason why she stopped working at, at the, the counseling center and is now a, a full time stay at home mom. And then when we kind of rejiggered our schedules, it's like, oh, this is a lot better. I, like I said, it took time to tell I didn't think it would be that hard. I thought, you know, we just re rejigger our schedules and everything would just work out. And that's, that wasn't true. It was, it was really, really hard. 
And little cut, little kids already kind of tax your mental energy. I don't know if any of you have uh, little brothers or sisters at home, but uh, they do things like they don't sleep at, at night, and so your your sleep is interrupted. Uh, they do things like demand to be uh, taken care of at uh, not just at nighttime, but whenever they're hungry, and there's there's not much patience for uh, that, and there's all kinds of things like temper tantrums and. Um, uh, and especially when they're newborns and, and toddlers, communication is difficult because they haven't even learned how to speak or they're just learning how to speak. And, and so they know what they want, but they can't express it in a way that you understand. And so they get frustrated because they can't say what they really want to say. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of just built in tension to having a, young, a very young child in general. So, so those were two of the, the biggest surprises that I kind of um, encountered as, as a, a, a dad, as a parent, that I wasn't prepared for. Um, the, the latter one obviously has kind of resolved itself because my wife is now stay at home, so we don't have that tension. Um, but I don't know how many of you saw this in your parents over the spring or the fall, or in maybe some of your coworkers with the internships you, you were at. But COVID has really um, hit a lot of family hard this way, right? Because families have. Um, had to take care of their kids because they haven't been at school, and yet many families don't have the luxury of being able to have one dedicated stay-at-home parent. They have to uh, both work to be able to pay for um, the house and, and be able to um, do the, the things that they do. And and so it it's been a very stressful. Well, for everyone in, in the world, it's been a stressful six months, right? But this has been an added stress that a lot of families have, ex have experienced. It is because there, there hasn't been a good way to be, to work and to parent and to teach and to do all these things that are, are required of you. Um, hopefully, most companies were kind of like the company I worked at, and they were very explicit and told the parents, hey, we understand that you're in this, this line, where if you're in an impossible situation where you're being asked to work the same amount as you were before, and now you have to take care of your kids the whole time. There's no such thing as child care or, or school or any of these things. And we'll, so we're going to let you off the hook. I don't even want to use that. We're going to be responsive and re realize that we know that's not possible. And so we're going to only ask of you what is, is reasonable of you during this time. And there were companies like that that did that, and that's wonderful. But I don't think every company was like that. And I don't know what it must have been like for the parents who were in that situation. Because I don't know how you, how you respond. Um, it's hard enough. I think one of the fears for people who struggle with this is that if they put up a boundary with their boss, with their project manager, that they're risking their job. And that saying no is just not an option. So I think in normal circumstances, that fear is kind of underlying what's going on at all times. I think in the past six months, that's only been heightened. Because if I lose my job, what other option is there? Right? That is a really scary thought. What if I lose my job and there's nothing else for me? Now, we are in a fortunate situation, all of us in the room, that we're being trained 
for jobs that are in higher demand than there are um, supply of employees. And so we kind of have a luxury to feel like, um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll always get a job. And I don't know if some of you are, are kind of feeling like, well, I don't know because of COVID. But in past years, I've seen seniors kind of being lackadaisical about their job search because of that kind of, of concern. Um, feeling like, yeah, I'll get a job. That, that won't be hard. There's, there's lots of jobs out there. I'll, I'll be able to manage. But not everyone is, is in that position. Um, and so that's a really, really scary situation. And so um, that is a um, underlying factor why some people um, end up working even more than they themselves want to. If you ask them straight up, you work too much and say yes, but I don't have any other options. I can't say no. I don't, you know. Um, so I want you to be aware of that. That is that's kind of always this underlying tension that's going on. And is that if I say no. I might pay, pay the consequences. I want to encourage you, even though I don't think anyone is in the seminary, um, even though you're not, I mean, I've had seniors who are married, even though you're not married to start making decisions that you will make it easier for you when you are married. So look for jobs that don't have that underlying tension underneath them. That you will feel comfortable putting up reasonable, reasonable boundaries about how much you can and can't do. So when the time comes that you need to put up that boundary, you will feel safe to be able to, to do something like that. I did a horrible job of this when I was your age. Okay, when I, um, when I graduated, um, I, was, I was single, I wasn't dating anyone, and so my mentality kind of was like, well, what does it matter if I spend 70, 80 hours working because it's not affecting my family because I don't have a family, right? So no big deal, right? And one of the reasons why it is hard for me now is because during that time in my early career where I was developing habits of work, I was developing habits of work as a single person, not thinking about how hard it would be for me to change those habits upon marriage. So when I got married, I, I was used to working this kind of way and doing things the way I'd always done them. And that's great when, well, maybe it's not even great when you're single, but it's kind of, you, you can manage when you're single. It's not great. It's very bad when you're married because you can't live in that self-centered lifestyle. And I kind of built up around me a very self-centered way of living because I didn't think about that, that I was developing that behavior in myself. And that was very hard. It still is very hard for, for me to kind of push back. And I've been married now for over 19 years and it's, I'm still fighting that kind of mentality and way that I developed towards work as a, a single unattached guy, even though I'm not anywhere close to that now, right? So that's why I said, I want you to think about jobs that would support you in the way you would want to be supported when you're married. 
and, and to use that as one of the criteria for how you evaluate different job opportunities that you have available to you. If you have a job that expects from you something that you can now say, yeah, I could do that now, but I wouldn't want to do that later. I'm not saying reject it out of hand, but I want you to at least consider what the implications of that are. And to think about what that implies about what, what you're doing. Um, I don't want to work at a company where I don't have a voice that can be heard. And that's true in a lot of realms, but including this realm here. I want to be able to be honest with them and say, hey, this week I need to spend less time working because, you know, my, my kid's getting her wisdom teeth removed and I need to take some time off for that. Or um, we're, we're going away because they're in a, a tournament and we're, we're going to miss a few days we're traveling to this tournament or um, be, you know because we we have this late night this night before I need to recover and spend time with, with my family right I want to be able to have that conversation with my employer um, but I also want to be able to say in this in that and they're the same kind of conversation. Um, you, the, the project deliverable pace is too breakneck. We're, the only way we're going to deliver this is if we cut corners. And I don't want to work in a company that cuts corners. I want to deliver a high quality product. Both of those conversations are putting a, a boundary about what you can and can't do. Right? I want to be able to have both of those conversations with my employer. And I want to work at a company where my employer can hear those conversations and respond to them. I don't want to work at a company where they're deaf to my concern, where they don't care about me and I'm just an interchangeable part in the mass of programmers that they can pull me out and put someone else in to replace me. And that's just not where I want to work. That's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to live. And the cool thing about that is it affects, it, it allows you to be a better employee, to deliver a better product, and to be a better husband, wife, father, mother, um, family member outside of the, the workplace that you're involved in. And so it's like a double win situation for, for you. So at this semester, this year, as you begin to look for jobs and as you begin to evaluate the opportunities that you have available for you. If you haven't already heard this piece of advice, um, I want to be clear that the interview is a two-way process. It is not just your employer trying to figure out if you'll be a good fit for this company, but it is equally about you finding out if this company is a good fit for you. And this is an example of why you need to be able to have that kind of a conversation and figure these kinds of things out before you get hired. You want to enter from the very beginning into that right company that's going to value you as a person, that's going to hear your concerns and respond to them, and, and is a place that you you want to when you wake up in the morning you you're excited about going to work because of the, the, the place
because of what you do, because of how they treat you, because of what you're accomplishing. All of those things. Carrying on. Let's get back to balancing career and family. Let me pause for a second because I've been talking for a long, long time. And I'm ho I'm, I hope I've said some things that are enlightening for you, but I also hope I've said some things that have made you think, maybe even some things that have made you question if, I, if, I, if I'm saying the right thing for you. So, what kinds of questions do you have after hearing that long? Winded uh, this uh, monologue from me. Yeah, I think uh, you know, a lot of other majors and like careers, uh, especially ones that are. Where the job market is now. Uh -huh. in this area. A lot of people say that your first job out of college will not be anywhere near like what you want to be in long term, or uh, it just won't be as exciting, especially coming from Kayla. Like, you won't have that sense of community that's just handed to you. Like, you have to be a lot more initiative about creating that yourself. Do you think that that's any different for this field as far as like you don't have as much? To choose from, and you, regardless of how well you do with the job, is trying to find a place that works for you long term. But the reality is that you're like your first few years are going to be a lot of figuring out what you actually like about the type of company you work at. Or do you think that? Um, I definitely think there is a bit of trying to figure yourself out and what you like, but. Uh, I don't think there's that same level of you have to kind of prove yourself and do the entry level task before you'll be allowed to do the real work, uh, so to speak. And so in that sense, I do think it's, it's different. Um, you you could easily happen on like the, the perfect fit for you, that you do exactly what you want to do and that you love to do in your in your first job out of the school. That's to me, as equally likely as finding a job that wasn't quite your favorite, but you've learned that it's not your favorite, and you're going to transition on. Um, so I, I'm not promising it's going to happen, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if it did, kind of, kind of thing. Um, so, so in that sense, uh, I, I think your first job has a lot. Uh, has an opportunity to be a lot like what the kind of long term vision. The only the only things in my mind that kind of say it's not going to be exactly the, the same are um, one is just hopefully there there will be an opportunity for you to advance in, in your career. And move up in the company, whether that means that you're getting to do more um, chief architect or project management um, type things. And that, of course, won't happen in an entry level position. So there is some responsibility uh, options that you can grow into. That is just inherent. The second reason why is just the rapid uh, rate of change means that, um, and I know you've heard this all your life because I started hearing this when I was um, in elementary and junior high as well, right? But the jobs that will be available in 15 years haven't even been invented yet, right? And if that's the type of job that you move into, of course it's going to be different. So there's a, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a great expansion of the type of things that, that you might move into that just aren't even possible for you to to explore right now. So those are the two reasons why it, it might not be the same. Kind of thing. Yeah. I got two questions. One talking about like the time you spend your kids versus time in the job. Yeah. And I'm just making an observation. It sounds like weekends are incredibly valuable in your, in your experience. Yes. Yes. 
Um, I, I in, inherited um, a perspective from my father who grew up on a farm. Um, the idea that the, the work week, you know, Monday through Friday was you work hard and you get that done, but then on the weekend, um, it's not like you just play um, because uh, you have to work around the homes. If, if any of you um, becomes a homeowner, you will quickly discover how, how, how true the second law of thermodynamics is. Everything breaks down all the time at the most inopportune time um, and how costly it is. Um, and so uh, we always, as a child, did chores, uh, significant chores around the house on Saturday. And kind of like Sunday was a more true Sabbath where, where we weren't working, we weren't doing things. We were definitely going to church and um, spending time with family. And, um, and I brought that into to my family. Uh, because it's it's very true. You you have uh, I I have responsibilities at home, not just responsibilities at work. I have to mow the lawn. I have to um, I have to re repair uh, the broken things. I have to um, uh, you know. Last weekend, my job was painting the mudroom. They 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 just a never ending series of things that have to do. But at least in those things, it's around the home and it's about the home and I, my children can participate in those activities. You may have seen my kids occasionally here in the office, but they're not sitting here with me right now. Right? They can't participate in these activities that I'm doing here, but they can in those, those activities. So even though I'm working, I'm working together as a family. The second question was, I, I've heard the phrase a bunch of times as well, like, oh, like, oh, the job market keeps changing, the tech keeps changing. How does it change? I haven't actually seen an example of that. Um, sure. So uh, I'll, I'll stick even within the field of, of computing. Um, since I came to Taylor here, so let's say in the past 19 years. So approximately your lifespan so far. There was no such position as a web developer. Cloud computing was something that I did for my research at the graduate school and kind of helped with a bunch of other people demonstrate that that was even a possibility. It wasn't something that, that anyone in computing was aware of. So, so doing something on the cloud was, uh, you couldn't because um, no company made those kind of compute resources available to you. And, um, and, and so, and DevOps was not even a, was not even named yet. That, that position was where you kind of this hybrid developer, system administrator, operator, those things. All have come in the, in your lifetime within the field of computing itself because of how we, we view um, computing and computing resources and so forth. Um, there, there are all kinds of fields outside of computing, maybe that are more less perfectly related, like a, a, a big data analyst, um, which requires cloud computing and large masses of, of data to, to be able to be effective. Um, and, um, and data visualization and, and so forth. There, there, there are all kinds of, of careers like that. Um, machine learning uh, and on and on. That as new technologies come, there are new ways of approaching problems, the ways of solving problems. Um, and so jobs change as a result of that. Jobs come into existence or die out. Yeah. Did you 
mentioned there are seasons in work. Yeah. Like sometimes you're more busy. Yeah. Less. Yeah. So when you foresee like there will be a busy season coming, yeah. How do you communicate to your family with that? Yeah. Well, the first thing is to actually do the communication. That's a big part of it. Um. It used to be that I could have a, a pretty quick conversation with my wife and say, hey, um, I'm going on a conference. I'm going to be out of town for, for the next five days. And, um, and she'd be like, oh, yeah, conferences are important to your career development. And we yeah, And we on the calendar, and I know it's coming. Now it's a little bit more complicated. Um, because it's not just me informing my wife, but it's um, it's maybe me having a discussion with my wife ahead of time. Like, is this how is this going to work with everything else that's going on in our lives? Are they coming up? Is this a good time to do it? How are we going to manage that? You know, are you are you going to be able to do that if I'm if I'm not present? Or am I asking too much of you? Um, how are the girls going to re respond to that larger absence? Um, and you know, is it worth it? Um, and, and and so that discussion has to take place. Um, and sometimes I've had that discussion about. I'll give a, I'll give a concrete example rather. Than um, many years I've been here, I have graded AP exams. Um, and the way AP exams work is you go somewhere else um, as a reader, you grade for seven days. So you have it, you're gone for nine because you travel before one day and you travel after. So work seven days, gone nine days. Um, and then as I moved up in kind of the AP hierarchy, um, where I've been a leader, a table leader, and a question leader, um, you, you're not just there seven days, but then you're there 11 days, and then you're there 13 days. Um, and, and so I've had this dialogue with my wife, is it worth it? Because you know, I'm gone now 13 plus two, I'm gone for two weeks. Is, is that worth it? And there's a lot of things that, that come into play. Sometimes the answer has been no, because it's right after the school year is over, usually, right? It's, it's the first or second week of June. And for some faculty, they've been out for a month, so they've kind of had their down cycle, and they've kind of had a chance to rest and relax. But at Taylor, because commencement is at the end of May, it was like, oh, you know, just like you're sprinting to, to finish or, or crawling across the, the, the finish line at the end of the, the semester, the faculty are kind of in the same boat, right? It, it's wearing for us both. And then I go ahead and leave. And that can be really hard. So sometimes she said, no, I cannot, I cannot manage two weeks of you gone. Um, I, I need you here and present with the girls. But sometimes it's been like, oh, well, we were planning to do this extra activity, uh, like uh, go to my sister-in-law's uh, place because their daughter was graduating um, from high school. And so we wanted to take a whole family and celebrate with them. Um, but you know, we have a family of six, and so flying down to Florida is a non-zero cost activity. Um, so, so it was like, okay, we'll go to Florida, you'll come with us, but you'll just leave a little bit early and go grade AP exams, and your grading AP exams is going to take the most time. And in this case, it's worth it. Right, so it, same experience one year, not worth it. Next year, it's really helpful for getting to so that's the key thing is that not, and this is where I struggle. I like to just declare, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, yeah, that's not a great way to be married. 
Um, <laughs> uh, having that dialogue and allow allowing it to be yes, it's okay, or no, it's not okay, and then responding appropriately. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. You might not have an answer to this, but like as a female, as the one that'll be like having the children, you know. Uh -huh. If I have like three children, let's say, and I just have to stay with them until they're school age and like send them off to public school, yeah. that's like seven years like per child. So that's a minimum like 10 years I'm out of the game. Yeah. Is my degree in this field worthless at that point? Oh, that's a great question. No. Um, but I, um, be, because, because we haven't focused on particular technology, but we focused on problem solving strategies and learning how to learn. And just like if you think about some of the things that you learn as freshmen, if we just focus on those technologies are already starting to get out of date, um, but you're not worried about it because we focused on how you solve problems and how you learn how to learn. Um, and you're feeling comfortable about going to the workplace because you've been prepared for that as well. Those things do not age. Those things will um, benefit you just as much in 10 years time as they, they do now. Um, and so, no, um, you, you might have to spend a little bit more time because you didn't do the gradual I'm learning this, I'm learning this, and kind of a, a, a step function, like, oh, this is a lot to learn, but you'll you'll be prepared to, to learn it. And, yeah, so don't despair on that. Okay. Yeah. Did you find that you had to sort of plan or reserve time for like a lot of time with your wife? Is that what you did? Um, like plan those out and like very frequent? Like how did you handle that? Yeah, that? yeah. That's an example of me not doing such a good, good job. Um, but yes, that has to be done. Yeah, because my wife being an adult, um, doesn't demand like my kids do. Right? If I don't spend time with them, I'm, and you know, especially when they're young, I'm I am gonna hear it. We we as flexible here. My wife understands that, and and so she's like, yeah, you need to spend time with the kids, and it, and um, you need to finish this project at work, or we need to work on this at, at home. And if we're not careful, what we accidentally get into is we have allocated all of our time resources to everything else and we've forgotten to do that with each other. So yes, we absolutely need, need to do that. And it's really easy not to do that. We can, uh, we can fail pretty miserably in, in that. Um, and I know some like marriage, um, I know. suggestion that people give is, you know, have a scheduled date night. And, and, um, I think that the, the intention of that is, is around that very thing, right? Because you're intentional, it's going to happen and it becomes one of one of those habits that I talked about that didn't develop well, but right? if you develop it well, you've got that, that date night schedule, then it's easier to be like, no, this is important. We're not going to let it slide. We're going to spend that time with each other because if, if we don't, um, yeah, bad things happen. Yeah, it's a, uh, and it's easier to maintain that than it is to redevelop. All right, 
I would encourage you, you know, I'm one person. What I'm giving you is anecdote and how how I live and how I value my time with, with my family, and my girls, my wife, um, may not perfectly align with how, how you want to, to live. But it's hard for you to, to know that if all you hear is, is my one story. Um, you, you've experienced this mostly as a, a child related to your parents. Um, so you've got a second kind of data point that you can use. I would like to encourage you to try to start gathering additional data points that you can kind of hear kind of other people's um, perspective on the issue, uh, how they deal with trying to balance your family, how, how they try to um, prioritize these, these times with, with, with the days with their spouse, how, how they're able to, to handle um, just the time demands uh, that are naturally put on each of us for, for our careers. And then uh, trying to make sense of all those, those different ones. because I might have some really terrible ideas. Um, and and I, I don't want to scare you not along those lines. So yeah, I want to encourage you to, to find other people that you can ask them about how do they deal with this, uh, especially if something I said here today was surprising to you, check in with someone else, you know, one of my professors said this thing, have you ever experienced that? Is that, is that just him being weird, you know, like he normally is, or is, <laughs> is that something that, you know, you've experienced too? And how have you dealt with Or, you know, feel free to stop by my office and ask some additional clarifying questions. I'd love to do that with any of you who take me up on that. Well, we've used our time up. Hopefully it was effective for you. Um, next week we will um, we have a, a new, hopefully, also important topic. I've got it listed in my in my handwritten notes. I haven't transferred it yet to, to Canvas. So look for some uh, assignments to also pop up in Canvas. I'll make sure to send out an announcement or two so that you don't get safe and get off guard. All right. Have a great week, everyone. As far as this class is concerned, I will see you next Thursday. Hi, Adam.